You're listening to Discography Discussion, episode 144, After the Burial. Hosted by Dan Terry. We're about to decide what you assholes are going to do for the next tour. <laughs> Fuck yeah. Chris McCoy. So would this be considered an alarm clock riff? I don't know if it'd wake me up. You want me to make it into one? And Joseph Wren. People still don't accept you for who you are. I've been doing that for at least the past 20 minutes. Presented by DiscussMetal.com. And if you're wondering what really happens after the burial... Brains! Then you are ready for this episode of Discography Discussion. I am Joe. That is Dan. That is Chris. I watched The Return of the Living Dead last night. I just felt like it was time. It's that time of year, right after Halloween, just before Christmas. You've already consumed all of the Nightmare Before Christmas that you are allowed to consume in the first 299 days of the year. So we just got to sneak in the classic 80s zombie movies because, let's be honest, the real zombie movies are the George Romero, right? I think that depends on who you ask. Me personally, I kind of enjoy the punk rock campiness of The Return of the Living Dead. I didn't say I didn't enjoy it. I'm just saying it's not the real zombie movie because zombies are a real thing. Didn't you know that? Totally. I mean, you boys ever seen that movie, Night of the Living Dead? Uh Uh-huh. It it was all based on true events. And then what happened? And then, uh, well... Everyone died. Oh, fuck you. (laughs) All right, so we're going that route. Let's talk about After the Burial, shall we? Let's do it. Chris, this is all you, man. It's all me. Where did this come from? Where did After the Burial come from? They come from my home state of Minnesota. They are a Minneapolis band. Started in 2004. Uh, put them in the category progressive metalcore. It's probably the best way to describe them. What do you think? I agree with that. They're not quite progressive death metal, but they definitely have that metalcore thing going on. Can we put the term technical in technical, there? Technical. It's technically technical. Yeah. I'll give it that. It's a little genty. It's got the gent. I like the gent. Everybody loves the gent. Good evening, gentlemen. Sorry, I'm like bouncing back and forth. This this might be another throw an elbow situation. Oh, God. Do we need to have another 15 seconds? No, no, I don't think so. I think we're fine. I think Chris decides now. <laughs> Bam. <laughs> Hold my beer. So I didn't hear about this band until I did, probably about 2008, 2009. And I listened to their first record quite a bit. And uh, I, you know, I really love this one because it starts off kind of generic like it it, they've got the intro track you know the hardcore band has the intro track and uh but whenever you get into your first actual song and they at first i was kind of like oh this kind of sounds like shit like (laughs) like not not that the band sounds like shit but just that the production quality on the record is uh less than ideal yeah overall that record like front to back might be my favorite record but I can't give it that spot just because of the production quality. Like I said earlier, if I came into a bunch of money, I would throw a ton of money at that band to go out and re-record this record because musically, the album is it's top-notch. It's just the sound is just not that great. Yeah, I agree. Well, a steady decline, the song is... It starts off kind of generic sounding and then goes into kind of this really cool melodic... Like, just there's a lot of noodling going on, which, I mean, I love noodles. I love buttered noodles. Like ramen noodles. And guitar noodles. And guitar noodles. Pasta aglio olio. They did re-record three of the tracks uh, later on, I want to say around maybe 2010 or 11. They went back and re-recorded three of the tracks from the album. Yeah, with their new singer. Yeah. Usually pretty smart to do. Yeah, I think this record slays, but at the same time, it's also really weak production-wise. Where the breakdowns just don't hit how they should. The crunch doesn't sound quite right. It's like they mixed it like a pop record. Or this was just as good as they could do. Judging by the sound of the snare drum, somebody paid somebody a little bit of money to record the band and mix it the best they could. Knowing what home recording technology was in 2006, even if you had all the money in the world, this is pretty damn good, even if they did it themselves. I don't know that that's the case, but I would have accepted this if this was something I created. I think it sounds pretty good, but it, it doesn't, like, this band's other music overshadows this, I guess is what I'm trying to it say. Does. The album, is, musically, it's flawless. It's just the production. Were they literally forging their future selves? <laughs> I guess that's kind of like becoming the archetype. <laughs> forging your future self, something like that. I don't know. Maybe they weren't following instructions. You know, it's just another man's opinion. What I like about this record is how dissonant and crazy it can get like kind of chaotic sounding but all sound very intentional you know because like you've got chaotic bands like the chariot that just sound like they just got together and like man wouldn't it be really fucking sick if we just like played a bunch of feedback fucking diminished chords and shit and then just like threw a breakdown in there like 
There's no, those, thank you. yeah, like there's those bands, and then after the burial does that, but it's kind of more of a controlled chaos, and all the songs kind of fit in overall structure. Where you know, if you're looking, at, if you're looking at their like right out of the song, you know, it's probably like chaotic part <laughs> versus them just being a chaotic band, and uh, and I like that about it is that like they're a little uh, they're a little unpredictable without being like fucking jazz musicians about it. Some of their breakdowns have that jazz infused guitar feel to it, though. I'll give it that. There's a little bit of that, and I, 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 I just don't think that it sounds made up on the spot, which is how I feel about a lot of progressive, quote unquote, progressive bands, where it's like play this riff, not play this riff, not play this riff, not play this riff. Okay, solo breakdown, we're done. Good night. You know, and like that, people can sometimes mistake shitty songwriting for being progressive. But uh, that's, like, not what this is like, man. <laughs> you know? Uh, I feel like After the Barrel has their own formula, though. Like, their stamp of their formula. You can always tell it's them. Yeah, there's no doubt. Yeah. And I, I think I think overall this was a... I mean, you can't ask for a better debut than this. I've definitely heard way worse debut albums by bands. And uh, I like this. I like the time that this came out, too, like, in 2006. Because I feel like if it came out today, it would be Deathcore. And it would be it would be so over like it would be so washed out with like too many breakdowns, them trying to find a vocalist that sounds like he has his head up an asshole, like with deep <laughs> gutturals. We'd bust out the vocoder. Yeah, yeah. Bass and, drops galore. After the burial is way more technical than your run of the mill deathcore band though. I agree. I, and I don't even think they're deathcore. But I am saying that if they came out now, I feel like they would almost feel the push. Definitely. Put more heavy bass drops in it. I get it. Yeah. yeah. And I, I, what I like about this record is it sounds like what it is, a record that came out in 2006. And this was kind of like mid-MySpace era. So this was like this was like my fucking prime, you know, for getting into these kind of bands. And uh, in that respect, you know, I heard my first After the Burial songs on MySpace, and I don't regret it. And uh, back then, I didn't notice that the sound quality wasn't that good because it was on fucking MySpace. Right. But I think uh, I think a couple years later, they really came back in rare form. That's the first album that I heard of this band, is rare form. I had to go back and find the first record. But I did find them on MySpace. That's how I discovered After the Burial. Well, before we viciously reform features, I want to take this time to say thank you to everyone for listening to the podcast. Thank you for listening and for subscribing. If you are not a subscriber, then you can find everything Discography Discussion at DiscussMetal.com. We are on Spotify, Apple and Google Podcasts, TuneIn Radio, Stitcher. So if you have an Amazon Echo or a Google Home, you have no excuse. Ask it to play the latest episode of the Discography Discussion podcast, and it will. We're also on Facebook and on Twitter at Discuss Metal. Be sure to like, favorite, and subscribe. It really helps us out. It lets us know you're listening. And now Dan is going to tell us all about five-star reviews. Well, we love five-star reviews here on Discography Discussion. And I'm going to read you one right now that it was on our Facebook page. This is from Eddie Cook. He says, just found you guys this week. Love the show. Keep it going, guys. Well, thank you very much for recommending us on the Facebooks. That helps us out quite a bit with the algorithms and all that good stuff. And uh, you know, really enjoy the archives, man. If you, if you just found the podcast on November 7th, you've, uh, you've got your work cut out for you as far as going back and checking out all those old episodes. You know, we just did an episode on x and I can tell you that it was a highly anticipated episode, and I was really surprised by the amount of people that shared the episode. Uh, that's what made it one of our biggest episodes yet. It was uh, a long time coming, and everybody came out of the woodwork and shared it everywhere humanly possible, all over the Facebook and Instagram and uh, I really, really appreciate that, and we will uh, hope, really, really hope to keep that going because that, uh, that, that just, that really helps us out more than you could know. Speaking of the Extol episode, we got an email from Turnification, who we mentioned on that episode. His, he was one of the more vocal supporters of Extol and wanted us to do an episode. He says, "Thanks for the shout out on the Extol episode." And yes, my email address does represent the glory days of said bands. The glory days indeed. (laughs) (laughs) I have had this email for a long, long, long time. Mortification has been pretty much over since Jason Sherlock left. Totally agree. I like Blood World after revisiting it, but you have to almost consider it a separate band. Eventually, (laughs) I'm sorry, everything past that is so depressing. Anyways, keep up the great work on the podcast. Thank you, Turnification. I'm really glad, man, that we were able to get that episode out for you. I know you'd waited a long time for it. Speaking of that episode, we got a comment on YouTube from Mushroom Nerd. I love this. Thank you very much. 
Bob K says, excellent. And Burning Mask says, genuinely love your guys' podcasts. Definitely deserve more attention than what you get. Well, we got a lot of attention last week after that x episode, so thank you very much for that. We appreciate it. And hopefully you will continue to find bands that you like. I noticed that the comment was on the Nine Inch Nails episode. How do you guys like the new Discuss Metal episodes? Toby Wright, Paul Kerr, just saying. I loved them. But I was on them, so I'm kind of biased. <laughs> we have a really good one coming up for you guys with Matt Fox of Shy Halud. Oh, shit. Yeah. When did that happen? I was there, wasn't I? <laughs> 2008, Rare Form. This is my favorite after the burial record. Oh, hands down, it's my favorite record. It's not the first one I ever heard, but it is really good. When you heard it for the first time, who was the vocalist on it? Did you hear like the first release or the re-release with Anthony on it? Definitely the reissue. But I remember that because there was a huge fucking sticker on the front of it that said reissue. Right. But uh, the neon green. Let's get into that, actually, uh, whenever we're kind of done talking about this record. Like, uh, if there's any noticeable differences, uh, obviously, other than the vocals. Um, but this record is... You know, as much as I complained about the production on the first record, this is not nearly as bad. I think the production is pretty solid on this record. It's fucking great. Uh, they, they've got that kind of studio-assisted bass drop going on. Uh, it's not as bad as it would become in a few years with other bands. It's acceptable at this point. I think they're actually capturing how heavy the band really is, and I don't feel like the last album did that. Yeah, this album, I can't really give you any standout tracks because again front to back this album they're all bangers the fractal effect is great that is my, i guess that would be my favorite the breakdown that's got that jazz that jazzy breakdown in it man i love yeah. it i saw them on the 10 year uh tour anniversary tour of this album they played front to back it was awesome i'm glad bands are doing that now morgan rose brought it up on the seven dust episode seminal records or fan favorites are hitting that 20 year mark or that 10 year mark and bands are playing it in its entirety that's what we want just play the songs that we like and make an event out of it guys come on well when they do the like the the whole record front to back because when the regular stage show they're not going to hit all the deep cuts that you know some fans want to hear so that's what's cool about getting to hear it front to back on an anniversary tour the fractal effect, like, that's not something they're going to pull out in their regular set list now. It's a deep cut. Yeah. But I love it. And that, really what I love about these records, too, is they're just the right length. Because, man, I get a little bit nervous anytime the word progressive is thrown on anything. I'm like, Jesus Christ, this is going to be a 72-minute self-indulgent piece of shit. I did notice on, like, all their albums, they don't, they don't go above nine tracks. Did you notice that? <laughs> I loved that. Yeah. It's not because I didn't enjoy them. I mean, I'm sure I would enjoy an hour-long record by this band as much as a half hour, but they kind of get their shit across quicker than a lot of bands like them. Because, like, there's a little bit of, like, that Between the Buried and Me stuff going on with this band, with the noodle, especially in the guitar work, the noodling and everything. They're a little bit more focused on breakdowns. Like, I like that they keep the core element to it, and part of that core element is the punk rock influence. Definitely. And the punk rock influence means get in, say what you got to say, and get out. They do that really well. They, they don't hit us with overly indulgent intro tracks. They have the one on the first album, but it's only two minutes, so get the fuck over it. You right. did say overly indulgent. They don't do that. It's only a little indulgent. <laughs> but that's okay. Like, I don't have any issue with what After the Burial is throwing down on this record at all. And this, again, was a better realization because I think a lot of people think of this album as their debut. Yeah, their first record, I, I don't even know what label or who distributed it. I don't. That, they weren't on Sumerian until this record, and every record after this is on Sumerian. But I don't. I couldn't find. It took me forever to find Forging the Future Self like an actual physical copy of it. Yeah, you can stream it now, but yeah, it was. It used to be Slim Pickens when it first came out. I, I want to say I ordered it from the band, I think, on MySpace. Anyone listening in Minneapolis, I actually found the, the Forging the Future Self in like the used like cheap bin at Cheapo Records in That's Uptown. awesome. I, I love hearing that because you guys all know how much I love to thrift. I think that this record just shows that this band, like, because, I mean, how many bands came up in 2006 through 2008 that were really influenced by Azalea Dying? There's or, a handful. <laughs> there's more than a handful, man. Th these are like the big you've ever had it's way more than a way more than a uh, the handful i don't know if i can leave that in the show it's too much <laughs> it's too much is what i'm trying to say well if he beeps it people are gonna be like is he talking about a or about a i honestly don't hear as i lay dying in this band no and that's the point i'm trying to make these guys actually listen to good bands coming up like you can tell they listen to shit like blood has been shed 
you know, like with with, the, with all those odd time signatures. Are you trying to convince me that after the burial is truly melodic degent music? Yes. Well, you've got four more records to get it done. Well, they they get it fucking done, dude. Like, that's the thing about this band is they they don't have a bad album. Spoilers. I love everything they do. I like that they don't rely on like gutturals too much. Yeah, and this is when Anthony joined up with this band. He has a crazy range. He goes deep. He goes high. Don't really ever hear a pig squeal, which is fine because that's not necessarily my thing. I'm okay with a pig squeal here and there. To me, pig squeals are actually more welcome than like a melodic chorus. Which you know we are going to get that, but you know I'm just saying like this record is just is just perfect for this band. It, it is a seminal record. If you want to listen to an after the burial record and, and find out what they're all about, this is where you should start, in my correct opinion. It's very rare that a band can address all of my complaints on the next record. 2010 in dreams. Oh, I didn't listen to this one. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> so. This record is a little bit more of a melodic side to After the Burial, yes. and I'm okay with that. I mean, they, they've always had melody in their music, but it hasn't ever been the forefront. I feel like they experiment a little more on this record, trying new things. Yeah, totally, and it, it's welcome because it's always been experimentation with them. But now they're doing a little bit more of the chaotic metal thing, but as much of a barn burner as their the first track is, this is actually a very melodic record. It's more it's more noodle than not. And uh, I even get a little bit of like hints of like melodic hardcore influences coming in. And uh, well, you guys know how much I love that. <laughs> Speaking of, of noodling and like guitar soloing, the the song uh, Encased in Ice, like just a crazy guitar solo in there which it's hard to follow what he's trying to go for in that guitar solo. Yeah. I feel like he ate some DMT or some mushrooms and played played around and then also like wa- like played a lot of Nintendo because I hear some Nintendo in there and it's just it's a crazy guitar solo. It's cool. It's just it's nothing you've ever heard on their first two records. No, it was very strange and really good that he didn't like bust that shit out on the second song because I think it might have lost some people. Yeah, I mean, the- you're a certain breed of asshole if you just hear a weird guitar solo when you're like, fuck this band. Dude, track two on that record, though, Your Troubles Will Cease, you can't deny that that riff in the beginning of that song. It's killer, dude. Like, this record is great. I don't like it as much as Rare Form because I'm a meathead and Rare Form is heavier, like way heavier. This is the first record of theirs where I maybe, if I'm in the car, I'm going to hit the skip button on a couple songs, possibly. Promise Kept, That's a. they're all over the place on that song. Not that that's a bad thing. Acoustic intro, clean gang vocals, and then it has the crushing breakdown, which I like. It's just a little bit of everything in that song. Don't you love how these bands are so subtle about introducing clean vocals? Yeah. Like, I think it's really funny how they're all, like, all of these types of bands will start off like the first two records are all screams. And then they're like, well, let's throw a melodic gang vocal in, see how it goes. And then when we do another album, if it did, if it was good, then we'll go ahead and incorporate more singing into our sound. Thank God this band didn't go full suicidal silence. <laughs> no, no, that's that, that's for damn sure. Uh, they did it really well, I thought, on this record. I agree. It's not. It, I don't love it as much as I love Rare Form, but I think that I think they were trying something a little bit new. But what I like about about the melodic progression on this record is that I don't feel like it was disingenuous like it is with some bands right because like some bands it's like oh you guys sing now oh you guys never did that before you know um you almost expect it though in 2010 yeah but they're they're doing it because and the singing's not the focus because like you're not going to find a lot of singing on this record but i feel like they're doing it because maybe that serves the actual song they're not doing it to do it they wanted to write more melodic songs end of story and it, but it wasn't to sell more records, or maybe it was, but you know the way they did it, they did it with, uh, to quote Paul Kerr from November's Doom, they did it with such class. You know, they, they did it really well, and they, uh, they didn't lose anybody as a fan, they didn't fuck up, they didn't do something just so fucking out of the, out of the stratosphere that you didn't really know what you were listening to. If you're a fan of this band, you're going to love this record. It may not be your favorite, but you're going to love it. You know, uh, I wish there was more to say about it, but it's a little bit more melodic of an after the burial, and I'm into it. I love the artwork on this record just because I'm a homer from Minneapolis, and the Minneapolis skyline's all over the artwork. Did this come in a digipack? It did not, no. It came in jewel case. Oh, God. You see, the artwork just screams digipack. Should be. I'm anti-digipack for well, a guy yeah. who still buys albums. I What's mean, wrong with a digipack? 
You get your digital version, which is probably lower quality MP3s, and then you get your physical CD with no case. It's just in a little sleeve. Yeah, I want, I want to, I want the 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 case. I want the artwork to come out. I want to read everything. How am I going to read the lyrics when I'm pooping if it's in a fucking digipack? Google on your phone, I guess. I don't want any feces residue <laughs> ending up in my fucking digipack, right? Well, <laughs> I have no problem with it being on my phone. Whoops. Uh, before we move on, though, I, I forgot to ask you, since you've heard both versions of uh, Rare Form, is there is there any difference in the music? or is it- I don't. You know what? I, I've listened to both, and I honestly don't hear a difference. I don't know if they just went in. And took like the mixed version of the original rare form, took the vocals off, and then Anthony stepped in and did his thing. Gotcha. I'm I don't think so. If anything's different, it's subtle and cosmetic mixing choice at that point. Anthony crushes though, like he's he's leaps and bounds ahead of the, the former vocalist. I know Nick Wellner was on the first one on Forge and Future Self, and I believe they had a different vocalist for the rare form. Grant something, I can't remember his name. I think that the original vocals for Rare Form. So for that guy named Grant, thank you, sir. You did a good job. Yeah, Grant Luoma. Yes. Lead vocals on the original release, and then Anthony on... I don't on. know what the story is, like why he stepped out and Anthony came in, but Anthony crushed. Is everybody else ready for Wolves Within? I mean, I was basically born ready for these kind of albums. It's 2013. The album's called Wolves Within. I'm digging the cover art to steal Chris's statement from earlier. Eventually, the riff's going to start. <laughs> at, at some point. There's your, I, there's your eight seconds of uninterrupted audio. There you go. This, this album would probably be my least favorite record from the band. Um, not that there's, the songs are solid. Is there something off with the production on this, too? Like, it just sounds kind of hollow a little bit to me. The guitars sound like they're very much in the background. Yeah. It sounds like somebody bought some eight strings because they listened to a Meshuggah record and said, you know what we could be doing, guys? We could be playing in low F. But the guy who recorded the record didn't know how to mix it properly. There's only so much low end you can get before it just sounds hollow and missing all structure. And no, Dan, you cannot get rid of the bass player, no matter how much you want to. Fuck the bass player. No, really, he's a nice guy. You should. I've but t- I, I talked think... to him before. He is a nice guy. Well, there you go. Did... No, nah, I'm not going to ask that question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Did you fuck him? Yeah. Uh, so... I wasn't in the morning, though. God, that's going to be my fucking... <laughs> Joe's going to cut that shit and... Posted by Dan Terry, but did you fuck him? Um, <laughs> wow. Uh, yeah, this I agree. This record sounds a little hollow. I have to admit, though, there was a huge difference between me listening to this on headphones. Because when I listened to it on headphones, I definitely heard that. Like, the guitars seem a little, like, in the background. And the vocals are kind of more forefront. And it just, it, there's, like like, a gap. Like, some kind of audible gap between the two. That kind of bugs me. I felt like this record too, like the drums stepped up a little bit more. Like it's a little bit more fast, faster record, a little more speed. Yeah, no, I agree. But when I listened to it on my sound system at home, like in, on on speakers, it was very loud and punchy and crunchy, and I didn't I didn't notice that gap. So I don't I don't know if it's just like if it was mixed for headphones or mixed for home stereo. Right. And uh, some some people like Joe is like he's so full of shit. He's trying to talk about production stuff over here. But uh, you're not wrong. What they did was mix the record for a digital market. So imagine you bought this record, but you actually bought the MP3s and you ripped it. Now it's digital and you're playing it through your car stereos or through those tiny earbuds that you get in the iPod box. I said iPod. I miss it. It changes the way the soundscape behaves. So a lot of the companies starting in the mid to late 2000s were trying to compensate for what they believed you were going to do with your records. Best example is still Godsmack. There's a total difference between I Stand Alone and Enemy. Enemy sounds like a pile of shit in the middle of the room, but you're on the roof looking down through the skylight. That's what it sounds like. I thought all the records sounded like that. We'll fight later, Chris. (laughs) Knew it was only a matter of time before Godsmack got brought up again. Jesus, this is like becoming your Sunday Day Real Estate. I think this record's really good. Like the material on it, which we haven't really touched on. Is very much in line more so with rare form. It's a little bit more meatheadish, heavier than In Dreams was. I'll be honest, this is I mean, I own this record, but if I'm feeling after the barrel, it's not what I pull off the shelf to listen to. No, and I, I agree with that because the songs, while good, don't really connect with me 
the way the songs on Rare Form did. But at the same time, that's nostalgia fighting the next record by this band, right. if that makes sense. This is probably, as far as percussion goes, this is my favorite record. As far as production goes? Percussion. Like drumming. I, th- I thought I heard that wrong. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no. I was like, we were just bitching no, about Dan the production. Dan is a monster on this record. This is probably their most genty. I would say so, yeah. And uh, and I'm fine with that. It was right in the pocket for when that was popular and not overplayed. At least not to me. It was definitely overplayed in 2013. All right. Well, Joe, <laughs> Joe has a different perspective because he hates that style of music. With a passion. But is it bad here? Like, let me let me put you on the spot for a second. Like, can you agree that there are bands that had the gent sound that actually knew what they were doing? Yes. Do you feel like After the Burial knew what they were doing? I think that After the Burial, looking back with perspective, was not doing the same thing everyone else was doing. But there's a huge difference between Popular Degent and a plea for purging. This is somewhere totally different where they're just playing low-tuned guitars and basically playing progressive metal at this point. They're at least composing something different. Does that mean they know what they're doing? No, it means they're doing what they do. And what they do would be heavily discredited if we didn't have that perspective. One thing I will say about After the Burial, Justin and Trent, like, those guys' guitar writing, they're insane. I would I would call this band a band's band. Like, musicians, like, dig on this band, I would assume. Hell yeah. I wouldn't necessarily call myself a musician because I'm just a guy that screamed over some records once. But yeah, I agree. Like, this is kind of like those guys that took jazz in high school are like, yeah, man, you don't even know. It's great. And you don't even know. <laughs> and uh, I agree with that, especially on this record with, with the Genty sound. And um, but I but I like how noodly they are, because a lot of Genty bands like they'll they'll do like, dun, 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 and they then they get the chug right and, but yeah, they don't get then, the rest of it right and, and like rhythmically they don't get it and this band gets it they they use the gent sound to kind of enhance the rhythmic attack that's going on this might be the first band that uses the degent techniques of reinforcing the percussion with the guitars and the bass and actually stays out of the way of the drummer. Most of them don't. I can agree with that. Are we ready for Dig Deep? Well, before we get to Dig Deep, there's a little bit of stuff we got to talk about. Yeah, the the, the original uh, rhythm guitar player in the band, Justin Lowe, unfortunately passed in July of 2015. Um, One month after he quit the band. Yeah. From everything I read on the internet, apparently he was suffering from some mental illness, uh, schizophrenia, paranoid schizophrenia, apparently. He thought that the band, the label, his friends, his family were all out to ruin him. And he he put some stuff out on Twitter about this, and apparently he was losing his mind. And then apparently he was found dead under a bridge just over the river on the you know, in Wisconsin, they, uh, the police apparently said it looked like a fall. They, they don't know if he jumped or if he accidentally fell. Shit. Okay. I don't know uh, what to say. That's yeah. extremely unfortunate. Yeah. yeah. It's a bummer. When somebody dies, man, it's, it's not really our place to, to dig into it too much. And I know much. that the band did have the Summer Slaughter Tour lined up that, that year, and they, they had to drop off of it to deal, you know, with the loss of their, their friend and bandmate. Yeah, that sucks. Yeah. But they did uh they did Forge on. They did and they dropped the album uh Dig Deep in 2016. Yeah, they did. And in my opinion, they're back to their rare form as rare form the album and with this record. So it's a not so rare form at this point. It's not. This album It's at least 33% of their discography. This, this album is a fucking banger. It's my favorite. I think they kind of dropped some of the industry tricks on this one a little bit more. This was just making a heavy record, not worrying about what it's supposed to sound like. This was making an after the burial record. And it's not that it's not that the previous album wasn't that. It's just that they were kind of experimenting either with sound production or like again, you know, we talked endlessly about how that record was like super genty. This one isn't as much. It's their best produced record. Yeah. I uh, I'm not sure of who, if Justin was part of the writing for this record beforehand, I'm sure he probably is, you know, July of 2015, he probably did have his hand on writing some of these songs. I'm not really sure. I, I think Trent is the, the, you know, he's the lead guitar player. I think he writes most of the riffs. He definitely does all the noodling. I know that. Yeah. Because that never changes. Yeah. And they still have their own sound, which I think a lot of bands like this can kind of 
fade into the background because like there's tons of other bands out there doing a style like this but after the burial kind of had their own unique sound in a scene that was filling up with deathcore bands and uh, i think they got lumped into that a little bit but they really weren't i, I would never consider this a deathcore band i would never. say i would say metalcore with a brain does Their that make sense? I think they're leaps and bound above most metalcore bands that are out there. No, I agree. Yeah. Like like a metalcore with actual thought put into it. Yeah. So, you know, with this band having their own unique sound that they could fall back on to put out a banger of a record like Dig Deep, awesome. And actually caring what fans think because, again, whenever you want to throw the word progressive on a band's sound, you expect to get like six albums deep in, or five albums deep and they're just on a totally different planet than what they started with. Now it's Opeth without the death metal. Yeah, but you know, with this band, they they want to be heavy. They they want to they want to do. It seems like on every record they try to do the thing that they did originally better. Yeah, they've never uh, changed up who they are. They, they all six records after the burial has been after the burial. And I love that. Just like and the vocals, I, I got to talk about the vocals for a little bit because. You know, th- <laughs> talk about the vocals so I can talk about the lead guitar work. Well, vocally, vocally, I, I love that this is harsh without being completely indecipherable. And that that's hard to do because, again, it's easy to do the deathcore thing and just go right into pig squeals and just that like, like the faux death metal growl through the whole thing. But they, they really kept it hardcore vocally. And I think that was their biggest asset because... It made their music more relatable to the overall heavy music fan without having to resort to, again, a whole bunch of cheap tricks to get people to think that you're brutal or whatever. Yeah, After the Barrel, probably my top 10 favorite bands. And like, I, like I said before, on a different episode, I'm not a huge lyric guy. I really don't know what they sing about. I don't really dig into their lyrics. Anthony delivers everything with passion, which I like. I just, I don't know what they're saying about. I'm in, I'm into this band for the music. It's a lot of self-indulgent shit that doesn't really mean a whole lot to me. Thank God it's not mindless. All right, Joe, let's hear. Let's talk about this lead guitar work. One thing about Deathcore that I do not like most of the time is the lack of thought-out lead guitar work. It does not take that much effort to gent on the bass drum, whatever the rhythm is. It does not take a lot of effort to make a random tweedly sound on the top of your guitar and call that a Deathcore riff. It really doesn't take a lot of effort to sweet pick your way through a guitar solo and have everybody think you're the greatest thing since Steve Vai. The one thing I don't think I've ever heard another band do is to have the degent where the drummer is a little more of the focus, less of the guitars. They do the metalcore tricks, but then they leave the melody in. And when most bands would just throw a bass drop in and just create more sludge for the next 15 seconds, this band breaks open and lets the lead guitar come out and it sounds like a constructed solo not a Kirk Hammett level of constructed solo but at least a guitar solo in the traditional sense because you can be random as fuck and call yourself progressive and it just sound like absolute shit this band doesn't do that there are elements here that I don't like in other bands but the way this band puts it together it's more consumable it makes sense it actually sounds like a conscious choice versus other bands just following a formula. Well, like Chris said, they have their own formula, but only they know what it is, and nobody's copying it. And yeah, I like how the music cracks open, I like how it breathes, and I like that they create an overall atmosphere with each record. I mean, the the only real criticism I have with this band is that they're going to always sound just like this band. They're not going to change enough for you to notice it. I'm fine with that. I am too. <laughs> they found, it's not their, even they real found their lane, and their lane is fucking awesome, and they're staying in it. 2019, Evergreen. Who is Evergreen, Dan? I created a code when I got out. <laughs> Do Ever- I need to let this go now? Evergreen Terrace? No, I don't know. Uh, another cool band that we should probably talk about. But, uh, you know, this record was really interesting to me because it's a little bit more, again, it. it it goes a little bit more melodic, I think. It does. This one feels more like melodic hardcore than metalcore. Is that hmm. bad? I mean, not in my book. I don't think it's bad. I don't hear the hardcore in it that you're talking about. I do hear that alarm clock riff in the background. The alarm clock like riff it. is waking me the fuck up, right? It's back. Maybe not Maybe not hardcore, but I don't know. Like The way, the way it's mixed and put together, 
it's hard for me. Like, I don't know. I don't feel like the melody created is reliant as much on Noodle as much as it's just in the riffing itself. No, it's definitely a good chugging record. Yeah. I, mean, I think I you've know. been listening to too much Circleback. <laughs> <laughs> Your definition of what sounds like hardcore has changed in the is past three band? months. This is the end. <laughs> Did you guys see the video for uh, um, Behold the Crown? No, I sure didn't. Oh, it's hilarious. It's a giant uh, snowball fight filmed somewhere in Minnesota, I'm sure. <laughs> of course. But they're all dressed like gladiator warriors, and it's all like... You know, they're taking each other out with snowballs. It's, it's all funny. very serious. Was yeah, anybody hilarious. drinking gallons of milk while this was happening? <laughs> if not, they missed an opportunity. I mean, what what else is there to say? It's another banging record by After the Burial. It it's might, heavy never put as out fuck. A bad record. I'm digging it. Speaking heavy as fuck, I think is it track two or track three? I'm not sure. Exist, exit, exist. That song is heavy as fuck. It's quick too. It's like fast. I, it's a fast speed metal kind of song that they normally don't go that fast with. Ooh, speed metal. We're going retro thrash terms on that one. Yeah, but you know, again, they're they're still after the burial, and it's not even a criticism because, like, I don't mind if a band that I like puts out a banging record again and again and again and again. Like, I don't I don't experience the same type of fatigue with this band that I do with others. I'm looking at you, Black Dahlia Murder. Well said. Because like I'm I'm always down for it. Whatever whatever they got for me, I'm always down for it. And I don't feel like the formula is obvious. I think there is a formula, but I don't think it's obvious. And I think if you're a fan of their previous material, then you're good. But if you're a new fan, I feel like this is still a good jumping on point. Final thoughts on After the Burial, Chris. Final thoughts on After the Burial. Uh, top 10 band, all time for me, musically. Uh, to go to if I just got a short drive in the car and I just want to rage. Um, if you like noodley guitars, if you like heavy ass breakdowns, you like Genty, genty uh, grooves. It's a band for you. Yeah, my Minnesota boys, repping hard. Damn, what about you? What else is there to say? I mean, they're melodic, they're heavy, they're the whole deal. They don't rely on a bunch of fucking tricks. They just fucking nail it pretty much every time. And uh, I, I love all that noodley guitar work mixed with the breakdowns and the genty sound. And uh, they, they never go too far outside of the box which may make them seem less progressive to some people. But to me, they're, they're a classic band that plays the kind of metalcore that I enjoy. And it, it sucks because when I say I like metalcore, I'm talking about shit like this, and that's not what people hear when I say that I'm listening to metalcore. Can I chime in for one more thing on Final Thought? If you would like to. Yeah. This I is do- my final, 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 final thought. I, I think this band is in the scene is underrated and for whatever reason has been pushed behind other bands. As far as the Sumerian catalog, I know like Vela Maya and Born of Osiris, like they're the go-to bands. I don't think either of those bands come close to what After the Burial can do. That's just my opinion. Well, thank you, Chris, for Bring sniping on half of what I had to say. <laughs> Pew! After the Burial is the first band in a long time that does things that are extremely popular in modern metal and previous popular styles of metal, but they do it in a way that does not follow the same formula. Dan has said it a couple times, they have their own formula, and only they know what it is. Whatever it is, is definitely working for me. There are things they do I despise in most of the bands I hear, but the way they're putting it together does not sound like everything else you've listened to for the past 10 years. So if you are a fan of metalcore, if you're a fan of Degent, if you're a fan of modern metal, there is something in After the Burial that you're going to like a lot, and you're not going to be able to explain it other than it's good. So listen to After the Burial. Dan, what's your album of the week? My album of the week? That's a hard one, actually. Circle back. No, not this time. I mean, it is, but... It's been retired. It is, but <laughs> Joe won't let me say it anymore. So I'm going to have to go with uh, Strong Arm Advent of a Miracle. Wow, going back. After listening to a lot of Shy Halud and talking to Matt Fox, I just want to listen to Strong Arm. Right on. Chris, what about you? Uh, I'm going with uh, the album called Fault by Alpha Wolf, metalcore band from Australia. It's uh, it's meathead, beatdown, heavy breakdowns. It's kind of my thing. Check them out. For me, it's Judas Priest, Firepower. Bringing it back off the shelf, driving to work and back, listening to it three times. Hey guys, this is your best friend in the entire world. Dan, here to ask you, is there a band you want us to talk about? 
because I like listener suggestions because I could just sit there and tell you about how every melodic hardcore band in the world is the best band you should ever be listening to. But I, I know that's not all of your guys' opinions, and I want your opinion. So can you can you send them to me? Uh, you know, there, there's a lot of ways you can do that. You can get a hold of us on Facebook at facebook.com slash discography discussion. You can send us an email at show at gmail.com. You can reach out to us on Instagram under Discography Discussion. You can reach out to us on Twitter at Discuss Metal. You can tweet at me and Joe personally if you have a bone to pick with one of us individually at Discuss Metal Dan or Discuss Metal Joe. And uh, you can also talk to us on our Discord server, which is running 24 hours a day, seven days a week, unless it goes down. But it hasn't gone down in a while. There's a link in our show notes that will let you go to our Discord server and sign up. And we hope to see you guys very soon. Let us know how you're feeling. Let us know how you feel about Discuss Metal. And we will see you guys again next week on Discography Discussion. And on that note, this has been episode 144 of Discography Discussion. Thank you for listening. You can like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at Discuss Metal. Subscribe to our podcast everywhere you listen to podcasts, including Google Play, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Stitcher. Visit DiscussMetal.com for all things discography discussion, and please send questions and comments to DanAndJoeShow at gmail.com. If you are not a patron, you can become one at Patreon.com forward slash DiscussMetal. We have some sweet perks. 